So anyway, we're so excited to have everyone here for our third class in our Humanistic Judaism 101 class. Um, I was curious for folks who have been to our previous two classes. Um, our first one is kind of an introduction on the whole thing, a little bit of sharing of our stories. Set, last week was Martin delving into the question of what is Judaism? What are the Jews? And so I thought before we move into this week's topic, I think we'd take a few minutes just to discuss any um, observations, thoughts that may have sprung up from the previous two classes, things that maybe you've you've considered or conversations have come up. So if, if anyone has anything like that, feel free to unmute yourself. Skip. Um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for those that were in the Hanukkah celebration yesterday, um, uh, I um, told this yesterday when we were uh, having casual conversation afterwards, um, and I thought I'd share it here today uh, with anybody that wasn't there. Uh, but um, uh, about a week ago from Friday, um, I attended uh, Shabbat services with a local Havara um, that is a reconstructionist. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of a unique uh, experience to 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 be with you know the people who are um, are coming from that point of view within Judaism. Um, but in particular, uh, one of the things that was a unique experience for me um, that called back to the conversations about Judaisms was um, that there was uh, an older woman who, who was also attending for the first time, actually, but she, she was Jewish uh, ethnically and um, uh, religiously. And when I had introduced myself and said that I was someone who uh, was, you know, had, had begun exploring humanistic Judaism. Um, afterwards, after the introduction, she came up to me and, and was asking me all sorts of questions about it. And initially I was excited for her curiosity. Um, and she was of course polite and kind, but uh, it, it pretty quickly seemed like she was less curious and more kind of, it was kind of more interrogative. She was kind of interrogating me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because she couldn't really understand what, like how a humanist, somebody that didn't believe in deity, um, uh, could could be Jewish. Um, and she kept asking questions about uh, when I explained, you know, that that our perspective is one where human beings are capable of of solving our problems and addressing issues and thinking about things, um, you know, with our own with our with our own minds. Um, she was asking questions like, well, what kind of problems do you solve? <laughs> and, uh, mm. and, you know, just, she really couldn't wrap her mind around it. And as I said, mm. she was very kind. And so there was no, there was no disputation or contention, but it was just a very unique experience. Everyone else was very welcoming. And there was even one other humanist there um, actually, but uh, just that, uh, being my first time ever attending a Shabbat service, I thought it was kind of in, uh, it was kind of interesting and, and a little humorous that that was one of the first experiences I had. Oh, absolutely. What's interesting too, though, even within these movements, how much diversity there is, because most of the time in a Reconstructionist context, humanism isn't that far out of the norm. Um, they they are compared to some of the other Jewish movements, much more humanistic friendly, but. Person to person, it can still vary widely. So that's super interesting. Um, it sounds like I'm, very positive. You could you could respond confidently in the moment, Laurie. I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting involved with the. I'm. I recently actually joined a um, Reconstructionist synagogue, and they're very. This particular synagogue is very um, aligned with my beliefs on Tikkun Olam, and they've been very LGBTQ friendly from the even the 1990s. I've mm -hmm. never joined a, a synagogue before and it's a new thing for me. And I was a little bit nervous about, I don't think the ritual, I don't think I'm going to go to services. I just don't think that really grabs me. It's more learning, the learning and the community. I kind of mm -hmm. take it from a humanistic perspective and I connect to community when I do group. It's not like I'm saying I'm praying to God. It's more like I'm connecting with my ancestors, with the community and in that sense, I guess I'm doing it 
in from a humanistic point of view. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Phyllis, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, I wanted to comment. Um, I watched the tape of the last session and um, a question came up as to whether American conservative Jews consider themselves or call themselves Missorti Jews. And I wanted to respond to that. Um, I was in the um, conservative movement here in Wisconsin, and we very much considered ourselves Masorti Jews. We we called ourselves that. We be belong to the Masorti movement. Um, we affiliate that way. We actually do. So I just wanted to answer that for the group that was oh, in excellent. that session last um, time. Thank you, fellas. Skip. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I wanted to add that I thought all of you would kind of get a kick out of was that, um, uh, and I forgot to mention this yesterday, is that 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 woman and um, and actually several other people as well at this Havada, they they kind of had initially kind of a difficult time wrapping their minds around an online Havada, like they couldn't <laughs> they they had a difficult time understanding that you know we meet from around the world together you know, uh, for the common purpose of, of uh, you know, um, worship, for lack of a better word, as humanistic Jews. And and it was kind of funny, like, they just were like, what? How, like, how does that work? <laughs> was, it's kind of interesting well, after three years of COVID that, but then everyone's different. Some people just don't connect to online. Some people just can't. It's not their thing. You know, I, I understand well, and, that. Uh, they they thought they thought they were like so like this is something you did during COVID and I was like no this is all the time because we're not all in one place <laughs> mm -hmm. and and I was like we don't have a humanistic congregation here there's no humanistic synagogue in in Utah and so you know I want to participate with with you people with my friends you know and um and it was just kind of <laughs> it was just kind of a unique experience to hear some of their responses. Oh, that is very interesting. Well, thank you for, for taking a moment to just kind of unpack what we have been talking about. I'm hoping we can keep doing that along the way because I think it helps us to kind of connect one thing to the next thing to the next thing. For today, our main topic is Hanukkah, but I'm also, I kind of have a sideways topic as well, and that is discussing and engaging with the Kavruta method of study. And I've really kind of gotten excited about this lately because I've taken several classes through the Unyeshiva. It's a program that's put together by the people behind the Judaism and Bound podcast. And in several of the classes I've done in that context, they also use the Kavruta method, which is a very traditional way of doing Jewish study. And I think actually it's a method of doing Jewish study that I think has a lot to to um, going for it from a humanistic perspective. And so I wanted, I'm going to share screen for just a moment because I'm going to read, I thought that Wikipedia actually had a really good summary of what Kavruta is all about. So I'm going to read this real quick. It says these first couple paragraphs. Kavruta, also uh, spelled Kavruta or Havruta, um, is a fellowship or group of fellows. And it's a traditional rabbinic approach to Talmudic study in which a small group of students, usually two to five, analyze, discuss, and debate a shared text. It is a primary learning method in yeshivas and uh, kolels, where students often engage regular study partners of similar knowledge and ability, and is also practiced by those outside the yeshiva setting in work, home, and vacation settings. The traditional phrase is to learn bakavrusa in partnership. The word has come, come by uh, medonim, Nimi to refer to the study partner as an individual, though it would be more lo lo logically described than pair. Unlike a teacher-student relationship in which the student memorizes and repeats the material back in test, Kavruta-style learning puts each student in the position of analyzing a text, organizing their thoughts into logical arguments, explaining their reasoning to their partner, hearing out their partner's reasoning, and questioning and sharpening each other's ideas, often arriving entirely new insights into the meaning of the text. Um, also, I'll mention that this word kavruta, its root is the word, also the word kaver, or friend or companion in Hebrew. So the idea of kavruta study is that it's peer engagement. It is people, ordinary people, getting together, reading a text, forming some opinions on it, and then discussing it. 
And sometimes it's, you know, not not much contention. Sometimes it is more contention. Either way, value comes. And the idea, I would also say in Kavruta's study, it's a little bit, um, I've, I've read a little bit about the world of improv comedy. And in the improv world, there's often this idea when you're doing an improv routine with someone where you're in the moment acting, you you try to not say no. You try to always say yes to further the skit going on, you know, to further the comedy. Um, in the same way, in Kavruta's study, it's not so much about trying to have the right answer, but rather it is as a group of two, three, four or five people talking through a text and then uh, having ideas and, and, and seeing if together you can come up with new ideas. You're seeking the creativity of this other person. And also, ideally, again, it's the best Kabrut experiences are where you don't necessarily agree completely. I was most recently paired in Kabrut study with someone who was much more orthodox leaning in his way of engaging with the text. And it was actually fascinating. He and I had some great conversations, even though we, we really didn't agree much. We found lots of parts of commonality. And so today I wanted to in, in doing this study and look at Hanukkah. I wanted to engage with that kind of study. So I'm going to go ahead now and share screen again. And so for this, for our study, and this is, uh, we're using a, a Safari source sheet. And I sent out the link for that. It should be in the chat as well. My suggestion is when it comes to, uh, when we're, we're, we're going to do breakout groups in just a little bit for our, our discussion together. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes kind of orienting us to this to this document where we're going with it. And then we'll do some, we'll do our breakout groups. We'll engage in the breakout groups together on the text. And then we'll come back together and we'll kind of unpack it some more and see where it goes. So for the source sheet, uh, we're looking at Hanukkah through a series of some different points of time. And one of the things kind of um, to highlight is that for each of these texts, It'll say what the text is. It'll say approximately approximate time period of when we think it was written. You were dealing with the ancient world. Um, it's always a little bit fuzzy. So you're going to see ranges of dates, uh, not necessarily uh, a single date. Um, also, when we know it, I'm putting the geographic location the text came from because geography is also important to give us some context. So. Uh, the first text we're looking at is out of the book of 1st Maccabees. Now, 1st Maccabees is interesting because if I know a few, I think we've had in the past some members of our community who grew up Catholic. For many Catholics, the first book of 1st Maccabees is in your Bible. And some kinds of Orthodox Christians, the first book of 1st Maccabees is in their Bible. It is not considered to be part of the Jewish canon. Uh, the main reason for that is its timing of when that, that text came to be, which was a little bit after the books that we traditionally put in the canon, but also because the book became most popular in Greek form, uh, not in Hebrew. And so because of that, uh, that's one of the reasons why the book um, did not make it into the Jewish canon. Nevertheless, because it's, it tells it gives us some history that we don't have anywhere else. Um, in fact, I'll mention for the text we'll be looking at uh, today, it's an English translation, but I specifically picked one that was a translation of the text from Greek. And the problem is, if you look at 1 Maccabees on Sepharia, they have a Hebrew text. But that Hebrew text was from the 11th century CE. It was a trans, so it was 1 Maccabees was probably first written in Hebrew. And there's some reasons for that I won't get into today, but we are pretty sure it was first written in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek, and that's where it became a bestseller in the Jewish world. Lot, it, became, it was very popular. It was read widely. It spread throughout the Roman Empire. It later became an important text for the Christians. Um, now, the, as time goes by, the, the original Hebrew text is lost to history. We do not have it. About 12 centuries later, in the 11th century, uh, someone translated it, translated the Greek translation into Hebrew, and that's the version that's in on Sepharia. Now, to me, that's so many layers of translation, and then doing an English translation of that, I just, I'd rather, so I picked an English translation that translates from the Greek, which is one step removed from the original source instead of more. Uh, so anyway, the first one is from 1 Maccabees. 
it's a longer passage, but it tells, but to, in looking at this, I want especially for us to look at what is, what, what is familiar to us in the story and what is not. What are pieces of Hanukkah we, we will recognize? What are pieces we will not? After that, the next text, and I picked, this is a, a passage from the Christian New Testament. Um, if you ever hear folks say, where's, for Christians that may push back on the idea of Hanukkah, I always point them to the fact that Hanukkah is in the New Testament. And so, but also what's interesting is this is also a very early, t one of the earliest texts we have about Hanukkah outside of Maccabees, because this is circa 90 to 110 CE of what was being said about Hanukkah. So we have that text. The third text, we jump forward in time a few hundred years to the time of the Babylonian Talmud. This is the, the Talmud, by the way, is a collection of writings that recounts the dialogue of rabbis, the sages about Jewish, the, the Jewish traditions. And particularly, it was envisioned as or described as being a, an embodiment of oral Torah, the idea that Moses gave Torah, the written Torah, at Mount Sinai, but he also shared this oral Torah with the people of Israel, and eventually the rabbis at this point in time in captivity in Babylon wrote it down. Um, if you've ever read the Talmud, it is a crazy, complicated, it, it's, 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 a, it's a trippy read. Um, but in this, we have just a little excerpt that talks about Hanukkah, and we see the evolution. And notice when we get to this text, what is present at 500 CE that was not present at 100 or so BCE? Because some things have changed. We then jump ahead some more to 11, somewhere between 1170 to 1180 CE with Rambam uh, in his Mishnah. Uh, that's not right. I believe it's Mishneh Torah, where that he gives, again, a lot of the embodiments of what he understands of Jewish law. And so he has his version of the Hanukkah story. And finally, we jump forward of several, uh, actually about a thousand years, to I have a short reading from the Reform Movement on their take on Hanukkah. And finally, at the end, we have some blessings, uh, both theistic and uh, non-theistic to look at. So, so anyway, I want with that orientation out of the way for our Kavruta, let's see how many people we have here today. Looks like one, two. I'm going to do it by screens because some of y'all are more than one on the screen, obviously. But we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It says 13 at the bottom. 13. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll break up into four groups of about three people. And so is the, is the, the um, text going to be also shared to the breakout groups? I'm in the process of trying to print it out, but um, I'm not quite there yet. Yeah, what we'll do is I is we'll put it in. I'll put the link in the chat now. So my suggestion would be, I'll stop share screen for a second. What I'll do is I don't, think, chat to shares, down. I don't think the chat shares to the con to the breakout rooms. Unfortunately, I don't think it does. And so what I would suggest doing, mm -hmm. and I'll play with it once we go into breakout rooms. If I can send a message to everyone inside the group, I think there is a way. I'm not sure. But if not, you might want to go and copy, copy and paste um, that link, the uh, the link that's in the chat yeah. now. And then I can create a window. I can keep a window open for it and just jump back and forth. That'll work. Yeah. So my thinking is we will, for the first check chunk of time, let's look at, um, and we'll do this for about 10 minutes. Let's look at the first two texts. So it will be the first Maccabees text and... Um, the John text. Uh, we'll look at those for, first. Um, and my suggestion is, is that as a group, picks, pick one of the participants to read the text out loud. And you could, you know, do it in pair, you know, take turns by paragraph, but actually read it out loud. Part of the idea of this is in hearing it out loud, you might hear different things. And then after that, take turns sharing your initial impressions of the text, and then kind of think through um, and discuss what do you recognize? What is familiar? What is not familiar? What do we know about Hanukkah from this? Um, and and then um, and then after that, move on to the next text of anything significant about that. So let's let's actually do five to ten minutes on this first 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 breakout session, and after that, we'll come back together and we'll invite each of the groups to share just a little bit of what came up in their group. Also, one other thing in this Kavruta discussion is that it's not just about the text that's on the paper. 
we each bring our own context to this, our own experiences, our own knowledge, background, life experiences. It's okay to bring that into the Kavruta discussion. And um, so if, if in reading you, you see something that really sparks something interesting for you, please share it in the Kavruta group and feel free to share it when we come back together. So anyway, let's go ahead and break. Let me do the breakout if I can remember how to do that. That's always the tricky part. Breakout rooms. Okay, so we will do we'll do four breakout rooms, and uh, and I'll also try to if I can I'll try to send a message a few uh, like a minute out before we come back together. Okay, so how was that? Was that a good conversation? Oh yeah. I think yes, so. I think so. Okay, so yes, for the I first, so. so for the first room, and that was I think uh, Carla, Casey, Paula, and Betty Ann. Uh, any thoughts that y'all had from from these texts? I just we 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 noticed the oil part wasn't there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we talked about the fact that the at least I felt that the the Jesus dedication one said basically every year we're going to dedicate rededicate or we're going to commemorate the dedication so that's hanukkah mm -hmm. uh, uh, was there anything else anybody else remembers that we talked about yeah just like that we didn't know that story very well <laughs> right mm -hmm. <laughs> so for the second oh i forgot i need to hit the record uh okay Recording is still going. Okay, good. So for the second room, I think that was Jamie, Liz, and Phyllis. Uh, what observations did y'all have? It's just me and Jamie. Um, we um, talked about how the story um, has changed, basically, based upon, you know, where you are and what you're going through, you know, um, and, and even in different countries and cultures and how... You know, um, we've exper we experienced it based on what we're experiencing in life um, and how even in our own personal lives, you know, depending on what you're experiencing and how your culture is and how you see things in life and how um, in my life personally, I now, you know, I, I was taught two very different versions of the story. I, I was taught a reformed version and an orthodox version, but even now I see it differently because of my own life personal experiences. And now I try to practice the Hanukkah story in terms of concepts of freedom and justice um, versus some fairy tale versions that may or may not have ever existed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we we talked about the historical background and and um, how it's changed, and I think I also mentioned you you mentioned how uh, Maccabees one and two because it was in Greek it was a reason that that might have not made it into the canon, and mm -hmm. um, I just brought up that that's probably true as well, but also in Rabbi Felix's class because I have two sessions of. Annika, it is also true that the, the rabbis hated the Hasmonean dynasty. So oh. <laughs> they didn't like the Hasmoneans and and therefore, um, you know, um, in any way kind of uh, because eventually and, and how eventually, although they were rebelling against Hellenism, they became Hellenists themselves. So in the end, they were adopting Greek names and titles and culture and the very thing that they initially fought against, as reported in the Ma books of the Maccabees. They ended up becoming themselves. So, um, <laughs> and how um, in when the rabbinic uh, uh, Talmudic stories came, it was in a way after the disaster of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, and the millions, perhaps close to a million Jews that were killed in that, that the rabbis wanted to um, ensure that the Jewish people got no ideas of military rebellion. And uh, and therefore, you know, this little story about the, the eight candles became a kind of a diversion to sort of say, well, no, you know, everything is in God's hands. So, um, you know, um, be, be good citizens and, and <laughs> don't 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 try any kind of uh, revolts that ends up in disaster. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. 
Okay, for room three, I think that was Catherine, Rebecca, and Simon, maybe. Uh, any thoughts that y'all y'all had, observations or anything? Well, one of the key verses we ended up focusing on uh, mentioned golden crowns and small shields decorating the outside of the temple. And um, we started talking about how um, solstice holidays nowadays are supposed to celebrate all this peace and love, but the golden crowns and small shields seem to um, seem to denote a certain uh, defensive mindset, like mm -hmm. defense against uh, foreign forces. And absolutely. Um, So we didn't really uh, arrive at any sort of synthesis between the two because um, that would be really hard. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Those two opposing meanings of the holiday. But um, it, it was a really interesting conversation about that particular verse mm -hmm. that you were supposed to be studying. Absolutely. Okay, for room can, four. Oh, oh go I'm ahead. Sorry, no, I was just going to jump ahead. in and say, uh, Catherine had a a uh, good insight in which uh, she's mentioned that it said that you're supposed to celebrate for eight days, but it didn't say specifically why. Why the eight days? My understanding is, is it was possibly because it was seen as a substitute for the holiday of Sukkot. Um, yes, that that's what I was told. Yeah, because it, at that point in time, Sukkot was the big holiday. It was bigger than the holidays. It was bigger than Passover. It was the big holiday. And so if you couldn't do Sukkot at the right time of year because you're in the middle of a war, then the next best thing is to do it late, but still to do it is what I've been told. Mm. Yeah, that's also available for, for, for Passover. So that's not unheard of. So, yes. yeah, I, I was told it was because it was kind of a, a Sukkot redo. Mm -hmm. So room four, was, I believe, was Adam, Laurie, and Skip. Uh, did y'all have any observations you'd like to share? Uh, yes. Um, Skip sort of pointed out that it was very, um, very natural, na sorry, nationalistic. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, Laurie uh, sort of emphasized that, that their emphasis on cleanliness. And I pointed out that um, often people with a ultra nationalist, ultra conservative mindset tend to be sort of a, very concerned with purity uh, and cleanliness. And I, I observed that in, in part of the text, um, it seemed at least OCD adjacent. Um, in its sort of ritual purity and, and the pedantic, the pedantic nature of it. Um, so yeah, it looks as if that's a lot of those types of people um, are like that now, and it looks as if a lot of people had the same mindset over two thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I, um, Adam was. Um... Uh, provided a particularly good insight in um, when we were talking about uh, about that emphasis on um, that you know it, the way that I framed it was that um, you know it, it, the otherization where if anybody comes in and you know steps foot in the temple let, let alone touches anything or 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 uh, you know um, d performs anything in the temple then it's defiled and just tear it down. And and Adam spoke about that that purity culture um, idea, and um, also talked about um, kind of the um, essentially what kind of boils down to what we would refer to as racism, um, you know that uh, that that was observed, um, you know, with uh, the Jewish people under the Maccabees, and. Um, Lori also commented on uh, 
kind of a unique experience. Um, I'll, I'll let you tell it, Laurie, but uh, in modern times um, where, uh, you know, with a, with a more orthodox community. But go ahead, Laurie. Where my, my grandfather was pretty much orthodox. He was an immigrant from Europe, and he used to close, he used to keep his shop, his shoe, shoe, shoe store open on Shabbat on Saturday. He wasn't that religious, that totally obsessively religious and the community was very upset about that they just really got upset about the idea of his doing business on shabbat um even though he was mostly orthodox and he in fact studied torah a lot but he was um deviating from that strictness Well, I really appreciate hearing all the different perspectives, and I, I mean, this is why I like about the Cabrita thing, because new new things bubble up, and it's really a lot of fun. For our next chunk of the text, and I thought for the next piece, we'll do the next two readings, and I thought maybe I, one thing I think might work a little smoother is let's go ahead. I'm going to share a screen for this, and let's go ahead and read these out loud together before we go back to breakout groups. So the first one is an excerpt from the Babylonian Talmud written around 500 CE, and it's from Tractate Shabbat 21a. So who would like to read this in English? May I have a go? Yes. What is Hanukkah? For our rabbis taught on the 25th of Kislev, the days of Hanukkah, which are eight on which a lamentation for the dead and fasting are forbidden, for when the Greeks entered the sanctuary, they defiled all the oils therein. When the Hasmonean dynasty prevailed and against and defeated them, they made search and found only one cruise of oil which lay with the seal of the high priest, but which contained sufficient for one day's lighting only. Yet a miracle was wrought therein, and they lit the lamp wherewith for eight days. The following year these days were appointed a festival with a recital of Hallel and thanksgiving. Thank you. And then the next reading, this is about 600 or so years later. This is from the Rambam's uh, Mishnah Torah. So let's, who would like to read this text? Uh, I'll do it. Willing. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. Okay. When the Jews overcame their enemies and destroyed them, they entered the sanctuary. This was on the 25th of Kislev. They could not find any pure oil in the sanctuary with the exception of a single cruise. It contained enough oil to burn for merely one day. They lit the arrangement of candles from it for eight days until they could crush olives and produce pure oil. Accordingly, the sages of that generation ordained that these eight days, which begin from the 25th of Kislev, should be commemorated to be days of happiness and praise of God. Candles should be lit in the evening at the entrance to the houses on each and every one of these nights to publicize and reveal the miracle. These days are called Hanukkah. It is forbidden to eulogize and fast on them as on the days of Purim. Lighting the candles on these days is a rabbinic mitzvah like the reading of the Megillah. Okay. So let's go ahead now. We'll go back to the breakout groups and discuss this text. And so... Just a reminder, if you want to have the text in front of you, um, the link is in the chat. You might want to save that before we go to the breakout groups. But we'll be in the breakout groups. We'll do it for about, uh, about five, ten minutes again, and then come back together. So, Before we go out, <clears throat> the yeah. last, the, who wrote the two that we read? I mean, the last one's the one we're familiar with. The... Uh -huh. the the okay, the very the, the 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 first one okay, so so far we the very first one was from first Maccabees, second one was from the Christian yeah, just book the of John. two we read right now, and then we 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 the third one was uh from the Babylonian Talmud about 500 mm -hmm. CE, okay. and the and the fourth one was from Rambam uh from the Mishnah mm -hmm. Torah mm -hmm. about 1100. So we're these okay. these two we're talking about now are 500 and around 1170 or so of the common mm -hmm. era. So it's a little bit later in time, um, you know, especially that second one is solidly in the medieval times. So. Right. Thanks.
Okay, everyone. So what what are some things we saw different in these in the second round of text? Dates back to ancient Greek and Roman times. The story that most of us know or knew. Mm hmm The custom of lighting the Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. One thing that came up for us is that the story seemed like it got simpler over time, like not so much a civil war as the war of the Jews, you know, against the Greeks or whatever. And then we we realized that like simple stories get passed down, stories get simplified and kind of smoothed over, complexities get smoothed over over time as it goes down through the ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we talked about um, how... Uh, In the context of the previous set of readings, it seems like the oils are just one example of mm -hmm. things that the Greeks defiled. And um, I, I found myself looking at the defiling through the lens of what Group 4 had said about, um, about purity culture. And I started thinking, maybe the Greeks didn't just actually destroy anything. Maybe they were just there and that was bad enough. <laughs> and the thing about purity culture is it really isn't sustainable. Uh, I mean, things get into each other. Life happens. <laughs> so maybe Hanukkah needs to be uh, adapted into a holiday about sustainability like how can we exist sustainably with other cultures and still be ourselves mm. the whole thing with the dangers of oversimplification reminds me of something when when my son was we were my family was just exploring judaism for the first time actually those of you in the service yesterday have heard this story but i'm gonna tell it anyway very short because i think it's a good one we had, and he really, it really captured his imagination, Hanukkah. But then a month or two later, we were attending a Greek cultural festival in our city. They were having food and music, the whole nine yards. It was great. We were, as we were walking in, all of a sudden, my son looked at me, and he's about six years old then, grief stricken, and says, We can't go in there. It's like, Why? This would be fun. He says, What if they find out we're Jewish? They're, they're Greeks. And of course, we explained, had a lot of conversation then about, well, a lot of time has passed and the story is a little bit oversimplified anyway, but modern Greeks are not the same as ancient Greeks and we'll probably be safe at the Greek cultural festival. But it did make me think about, you know, what messaging do we send our kids? And I do think children, especially, they love good guys and bad guys, um, clear cut, you know, no grayness. But reality of it is, is that life is messy and complicated and, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the stories we tell our kids, we need to be asking some questions about. But also, even if those are the stories we tell our kids, they probably shouldn't be the kids' story, the exact same stories we, we resonate with as adults. Skip? <clears throat> um, I really like the way that you um, brought that up where you talked about, like, the good guys and bad guys. That was something that I mentioned in our last breakout session, is that with the, with the story in the book of Maccabees, um, you know, it's it's talking about how they vanquished the enemy, basically vanquished the foe. It, excuse me, and um, you know the the and they were victorious, and so they were triumphant and and jubilant afterwards. And and I mentioned to, to Adam and Lori that it's it's frustrating to me when I read texts like that 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 talk about war and bloodshed in ways like that because. Um, it and Lori, you know, perhaps correctly um, uh, attributes this to um, to presentism on my part. But uh, it's very frustrating to me when these texts don't talk about the reality of war, the truth of war. Um, that even when there is an enemy that must be defeated, um, it, that it's still horrible. It's horrible for the people fighting. It's horrible for the lives lost. Um, you know, it, 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 if it's ever necessary, and that's a debate for another day, if it's ever necessary, it's a necessary evil. Um, 
and yet the the story as we see it in Maccabees is you know Judah or Judah Maccabee you know he's the hammer and and you know they, they were victorious and and it's just that oversimplification we talk about oversimplification that oversimplification of what war actually is it's it, it's always very frustrating for me Phyllis and then after Phyllis Adam so um we talked about that too in the first session um about the idea that it was a really really bloody war and most people don't ever mention that to their children and in fact the reform movement you know glorif glosses over that altogether and and refuses to talk about the fact that it is a bloody bloody war um and in the second part we talked about um in our session we talked about how um this is the fairy tale this this version here is the fairy tale that we all choose to either accept or not accept or debate about or contest or this is the story we all know about the oil you know and and you know the truth is this this is the part we fight about whether we accept this as the miracle or not. Um, and it comes down to whether we decide we believe in the miracle. You know, it was this a miracle or was it not? Was it how do we define miracle here? And and we were laughing in our session that, you know, you can define miracle however you want to. I believe there was a miracle, but was the miracle is was the miracle that there was a human who decided to stand there and monitor the burning of that oil. And for eight days, you know, I, I believe there was a miracle, you know, maybe the miracle was that there was some smart human who knew that there was only enough oil and it was going to take them eight days to go get some more oil and somebody monitored that burn, you know, I mean, come on, we, we it, there are parts of the story that are missing if it truly ever happened. Um, you know, it, it could be a fairy tale. There could be some truth. But, you know, like you say, this is a war story. And there's probably some private who stood by the burn and monitored the burn and made sure it didn't burn out for eight days because he knew there was going to be eight days that it took them to go get some oil. And that's the part we don't talk about. You know, I mean, come on. You know, <laughs> let's just say that. You know, in the in I was raised in a very orthodox Christian type of family. And the one thing that they taught in our in this religion is that faith without works is dead. And that's the one thing nobody ever understands in this Christian faith is that faith without works is dead. What they all believe is Jesus is gonna fix it. That's the part they hear. They don't hear that without works, without somebody doing the work, your faith means nothing. They all want to run around and hear the miracle, but they don't want to admit that somebody had to do some work. Somewhere there was a private standing by that burn, mm -hmm. <laughs> monitoring it for eight days, period. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I really appreciate you bringing yeah. up the military context because that, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good point. Adam. Yeah. Um, what did I want to say? Um, yes, I'm not sure how to interpret that line where Ramban says the Jews something their enemies um, I thought there are two ways that, that I could interpret that Ramban either thinks that it was a straightforward civil war Jews versus um, Seleucids um, and he, he either doesn't know or would prefer not to mention that it was more complex it was a sort of civil war and war of independence or it's simply that Ramban didn't consider Hellenized Jews to be Jewish yeah. Well, for our last, we're, we're, we're running out of time, so we're going to go ahead and jump to our next reading. But um, as we as we have some more time at the end for more conversation. So towards the end, we'll start kind of weaving all these things together. But for the next reading, and I picked this one specifically uh, for my own context here in North America, that Hanukkah has over the last hundred years taken on a very different meaning than it previously took. And I think in some ways that meaning has now become, I know in Israel, from what I understand, it's become a more predominant way of seeing the holiday. Uh, it still varies some, but I thought it's a good uh, picture of that. I found a reading from the reform movement. So I'm going to share a screen real quick. And uh, would someone like to read this? I can read it. Although okay. the practice of laying the menorah, also called a Hanukkah, 
was common throughout much of the 19th century, North American Jews tended to neglect most of the other traditions and practices associated with the holiday. By the 1920s, however, Jews increasingly added gift giving to their Hanukkah celebrations, prompting some people to refer to Hanukkah as the Jewish Christmas. Should I keep reading? In sure. some ways, the transformation of Hanukkah is linked to the growth of North American Jewry within its unique environment. The elevation of Hanukkah to a major holiday was partly the result of Jews accumulating, uh, acculturating themselves to a North America that was overwhelmingly Christian in population and symbols. Although Hanukkah had become an important holiday among North American Jews by the 1920s, it would be incorrect to regard it as an imitation of Christmas with an emphasis on the exchange of presents. Rather, North American Jews use this holiday as a celebration of family, reinforcing Jewish identity in a place where populations, population may be overwhelmingly Christian. Hanukkah is a means for North American Jews to feel a kinship with their neighbors while simultaneously asserting their Jewish distinctiveness. So this is a, a another very different take on, on Hanukkah. So we'll have about five minutes in the breakout rooms to discuss this and also to use this as time also to kind of go back to the other readings we looked at and to kind of think of them together of what do we make of these cha the, the changing meanings we have here. So we'll be in breakout rooms for about five minutes. James, are those coveralls comfortable? They are. That's why I wear them. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're kind of my everyday wear in the winter. I, I just don't see the point in regular pants with the tight waistband. <laughs> <laughs> Life is too short for that. I got a pair. I know mine are very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I only wear mine in the spring when I'm farming, so to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and mine are Roundhouse brand, which are originally were made in Oklahoma, so that's also kind of nice. So we went to my grand, my grandpa was his favorite brand. So, okay, we're hard hard out here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, mention before we go have a little more discussion, I did put some links in the chat. That my, One is I have a Spotify Hanukkah playlist. It's all kinds of random stuff. Not necessarily humanistic, a lot of more cultural stuff, but also all, all over the map of, of Hanukkah music. Uh, also, I put a link to some writings by Rabbi Sherwin Wine, the founder of the Humanistic Judaism Jewish Movement on Hanukkah. And finally, a resource page from the SHJ about Hanukkah. So just wanted to share that. Um, so for, for our kind of close out our conversation as we're kind of thinking through, kind of synthesizing all the things we've talked about today, and particularly what y'all have talked about in the last few minutes, your breakout groups. What do you think? You know, there's definitely, you know, what that last, comparing the last reading with the first reading, it's Hanukkah has evolved radically. Um, Mm -hmm. What do we think about that? What's what's our what what's our uh, push? What's what's our responses to that? Well, um, I, I was saying, uh, but, um, but in a way, calling it a Jewish Christmas sort of belittles the fact that it comes from a totally different type of story than Christmas does uh -huh. and um, doing it to fit in uh, sort of goes against the original uh, story of the holiday where um, the, the whole purpose of Hanukkah was like not trying to fit in so in uh -huh. a way the temple has been defiled again. <laughs> That's a fair point. We just like that. It's we we, yeah, talk we, we touched upon that too. Go ahead. Oops. Go ahead, Jamie. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, we no, thought no. that it was ironic that it was... the initial the initial stories. The initial stories are all about resistance to assimilation and acculturation. That's the foundational stories, right? In the Maccabees mm -hmm. is, is really about fighting against assimilation and acculturation. 
Um, and then now, all the way to what we have today, it's very much a, an acculturated celebration. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 an iring. It's kind of gone. Um, well, kind of the way the Osmonians went. <laughs> <laughs> they mm-hmm. they were resisting Greek culture, and then they ended up assimilating Greek culture in the end. So, yeah. um, I mean, where would we be? I mean, uh, like someone said, I think in the previous session, you know, to Haredi Jews, you know, we're not Jews. Oh, so um, basically, um, where would we be if we were at that time? Would we would we even be would be on the side of the more Hellenistic types of Jews, or or the the more zealot types? I mean, I don't know. It's <laughs> a good question. Adam. Hello. Um, I'd probably be an Epicurean or something. I'd, I'd probably leave Judah and go head straight to Athens. Um, anyway, um, the the whole the whole Christmas phenomenon, um, as um, as we've probably all noticed during our session, uh, traditions weren't weren't handed down from heaven thousands of years ago and remain static. You know, they're, they're constantly evolving um, or, or simply being um, created whole cloth. Um, so I think Chris McCurr is just sort of a, a continuation uh, of that process. Uh, I think it's a shame that people felt the need to assimilate um, or still do. Um, but I think now that it's done, Chris McCurr is, is quite harmless and a bit silly and, and quite fun. Um, uh, did it actually start before Christmas and Hanukkah actually overlapped once one year, or, or that maybe that was Thanksgiving or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Skip Skip mentioned that in America it's becoming it's it's gaining the commercialization of Christmas, which I was unaware of. Uh, so I, I think that's sad. It's a smaller scale of it. I was just at Target uh, yesterday, and there is a small Hanukkah display of various products. Now, that said, did I buy some of those products? Yes, I did. (laughs) Uh, Do we decorate our house with Hanukkah stuff like people do Christmas decorations? Yeah, we do. So we may be, you know, our family may be doing exactly the commercial. And I have mixed feelings about that. But I Mm -hmm. also think in... I think the to me, what was happening in the 1920s, my understanding of why that time period in particular, it was when there were some Christian evangelistic efforts specifically aimed at Christmas time. And we're trying to get Jewish kids to come to the church and have a little present and come to our Christmas party. And many Jewish families were very uncomfortable with that, but they also felt like they needed something that was appealing to their kids too. And I, um, as the stepdad of a teenager now, but when, I I can I can recognize the value of that. I mean, as a kid, you know, holidays involve presents are a really big deal. And so I, I even though I think might have question, I might have some objection to it in some ways. I also do think there's something valuable. Kids holidays that capture their attention. I think there there's value too, and yeah. it's nice giving gifts to loved ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I, what we do live like it or not, in a very commercial country. So it's possible that Hanukkah needs a little bit of commercialization in order to hold its own. Mm -hmm. And and, um, of course, it still doesn't run on the same calendar as Christmas does. Uh, It doesn't always start on the same day of the Christian calendar. So in that way, it's still holding its own. So Mm -hmm. It's a balance to strike, living in harmony with others and other cultures while still being oneself. It's a balance to strike, and some people spend their whole lives trying to strike that balance. Mm-hmm. I question whether we are holding our own at all. I really seriously question it. Having grown up now in both faiths, um, this year I turned on Sirius Radio, which didn't put out its Hanukkah playlist until the first night of Hanukkah, to hear on the first night of Hanukkah, my true love gave to me. I was disturbed. (laughs) I was greatly disturbed. Um, Mm. I don't even like that song for Christmas and leave alone (laughs) to hear it dwindled down to the eight nights of Hanukkah. 
Um, that was very disturbing to me to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's some things we still need to have a very, you know, Maccabean response to, and that should be one of them. <laughs> okay. You know, that is just, you know, there's some things we need to resist. And, you know, I look at every year, I look at the music that's coming out during Hanukkah time is becoming more and more Christmas music. Um, mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more imitative of, you know, there's there's a line to draw in the sand. It's OK for us to have our own music. It's OK for us to have our own stuff that we have beautiful sounds. We have beautiful tones. We have, you know, our music is not on the main beat it's very very disharmonious and it should stay that way <laughs> it should okay. sound like our music it should not start sounding like the first the 12 nights of christmas that's just mm -hmm. wrong it's just wrong i just it's think that that evolution is fine as long as you remember mm -hmm. the essence of what you're trying to be doing and you don't lose the essence of it so i don't mind some and to to what you were saying, Phyllis, that's losing the essence. Yes. So, you know, but but there are th there are ways to evolve without losing the essence. And the other thing you're saying is, you know, how does the rest of the world see us or fit into our try to accommodate us? That's what they're doing. We're yeah. not doing that. That's what they're doing, and we're disappointed. But yeah, <laughs> you know, I had a friend trying to explain to me how it was okay that she was just like me. And I listened and I waited because I knew something strange was coming. And she starts telling me how um, she was just like me because she was part of the tribe. And I waited and I waited because I, I never jump on a wagon too quickly. And she said, yeah, I'm black like you. And I said, okay. And she said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a veteran like you. And I said, okay. And she says, yeah, I was confirmed at a synagogue just like you. And I said, okay. And she says, yeah. And those Jews for Jesus, I joined them just like you. And I said, no, you did not. <laughs> That's where we're different. Yeah. I did not join Jews for Jesus. You're confused. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, well, that's hilarious. Just waiting for the waiting for the other shoe to drop there. Yeah, um, I, had to keep waiting. I knew something was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and then, second of all, uh, Phyllis, it, it sounds to me like like you think that there's a war on Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's the easiest one to attack. It's, you know, I think the next one they're attacking, honestly, is Purim. You know, there are so many satyrs that are not satyrs anymore. And it's just, I sit back and I watch it and I just shake my head. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> if, if someone, if a Christian wants to have Christian satyr, they should at least think about the um, people like my grandparents who went through pogroms at Easter time. And at, if they're going to do that, have a Seder on Easter, just at least remember that Easter was not a happy time for, for the, for many Jews. They're having them. They're saying that the last supper was a Seder. And so they're having them. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to mention on the subject of music, I will men mention in case you listen to my Spotify playlist, I have some silly Hanukkah songs that are parodies of Christian uh, Christmas carols. And I'll tell you why I enjoy them for what they are. And that is that I would argue a big element of Judaism is humor and of often even mocking uh, in a gentle, kind way, but often mocking the traditions of those around us. And so um, I take it from that perspective. You know, if, if I was saying what I want those kind of parody songs be part of a, of a synagogue service, probably not. Right. But do I appreciate them in the way that I pre appreciate Weird Al Yankovic and other people like him? Absolutely. For instance, the Jewish a cappella group 613 just did a Hanukkah parody mashup of all of, of, of quite a few different Taylor Swift songs on the sub on Hanukkah. And it is brilliant. It's hilarious. But it is what it is. I mean, it's it's a cultural kind of form, but I, I I hear what you're saying, and I and I and I'm I'm pretty sympathetic to that point of view in some ways. But I also I I think which I also at the same time I also see value in laughing and even sometimes gently poking back a little bit. Uh, uh, also, most of the Christ 
big numbers of the Christmas songs are written by Jews. <laughs> and I can get parody. I can get to the parody depending on who's laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, I I happened to listen to a podcast um, a month or so ago, and they were saying that um, there's no evidence of Sadas until centuries after Christ's lifetime. Right. Yeah, at least in in this form. That's I mean, true. was was there something kind? I mean. Was there a, a a Passover meal of some kind that was observed previously? Probably so. But mm -hmm. the Seder, as we know it, its earliest roots are actually, my understanding was something about the Greek Symposia. And it was crafted as a, because the Greek symposia, Symposium were so popular, these events where people would get together, eat good food, lounge about, drink lots of wine, and talk about heavy stuff. Um, and so lots of Jewish young people, especially intellectuals who wanted to party, they wanted to go to these things. And my understanding mm -hmm. of the Seder in part was crafted to be an alternative to that. Um, so it is it is another form that's it's a cultural form that's continued to evolve and change over time. So I just think that, you know, it, it just speaks loudly to the need for education you know, mm -hmm. the need for continuing to have open dialogues and to correct misinformation when we hear it and see it. Um, you know, and I worry that, you know, the lack of the open dialogue and the continuing to have, you know, um, conversations in, in, in areas where we have, um, you know, mixed company so to say, you know, we, we can't continue to have satyrs with just ourselves. We have to educate our neighbors. We have to educate communities that want to aspire to be us, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or aspire to take or aspire to take our traditions and mock them and make fun of them, you know, because when I heard this song, it was not in parody form. It was, it was, they were seriously singing on the 12 days of Hanukkah. And I was like, wait a minute, first of all, there's not 12 days. And second of all, you know, what are you talking about your true love gave to you? Eight days of hot, wait, stop. <laughs> You know, who's singing the song and who made the song? I went and looked up, looked up the song and it was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds dreadful. And, and, and it also sounds uncreative. That's the other thing. I mean, you're picking right. the most, most tedious cliche of Christian uh, Christmas songs. And yeah. Right. Real quick before we have some folks leaving, I just want to mention that our net, we are not having a class in two weeks because that's uh, Christmas Eve and a lot of folks are doing family stuff then. But on January 7th will be our next class. Martin is going to be teaching on the topic of adopt the question of Jewish adoption or Jewish conversion. He does have some links. And if you uh, if you uh, our class resource page and I'll put a link to that again in the chat. Um has links to this, but there's some things he he would love for you to to watch or listen to before the next class. But that'll be coming up on January 7th. And then after that, just kind of a teaser um, coming up is on January 21st, I'll be teaching on the topic of Jewish diversity from orthodox to humanistic. Um, and there's, again, we'll, we'll, we'll send out an email as well, some, some of this as well, but just wanted to mention that. And other than that, I'm going to turn off the recorder, but we will leave the uh, Zoom open for a few more minutes if anyone wants to continue visiting. And I'm just really excited y'all got to, everyone was here today. It was a really good session and really appreciate it. And also, real quick before we go, though, what did y'all folks think about the Kavruta during the breakout? Was that, was that, a, was that a way of doing conversation y'all felt comfortable with? How, how I liked it. I liked it a lot. It just felt like it was a more active kind of learning Good, good. Okay, I, I, think we'll, I think we'll keep doing that then because I, I I thought it worked worked really good. So, okay, I'm gonna hit stop recording and.